Hello and welcome everyone. It's 10 o'clock here in Houston, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you to everyone for joining our Heinz Global Perspectives Forum. Um, my name is Steph Bierenbaum and I'm the Chief People Officer at Heinz. I'm uh, pleased to serve as your moderator for today's program. And today I'm joining you from Heinz headquarters here at Williams Tower in Houston. So we're very excited to continue the conversation together um, from our first forum where we discussed the future of office design given COVID-19. Today we'll be digging deeper into the human element as we explore people, change, and purpose, engaging and supporting the returning workforce. Um, so our goal for today's discussion is to surface through the lived experience of leaders across corporate, uh, across corporate real estate, across the leadership spectrum, what's been learned about how to safely bring employees back to the workplace while keeping them engaged, effective, and aligned with company purpose and culture. That'll be about the first half of our discussion and our talk today. Um, and then in the second half, we'll also talk about what this means for the future of managing people. Um, so what's been learned more fundamentally about the nature of collaboration at work via this behavioral experiment that we've all been thrust into? What have we learned about how this will change the world of work going forward? So thank you again for joining us. We have a great panel today gathered to address this topic. So I'd like to introduce them to you. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Andrew Cook, who is a Vice President of Property Management in our Heinz New York office. Andrew recently celebrated his 26th anniversary with Heinz, um, and he has deep experience leading financial and operational complexities of a corporate real estate portfolio in many contexts. So he brings a perspective on how CRE and facilities leaders are approaching return to the workplace and how this is playing out in the various properties that Heinz owns and operates. So thank you, Andrew, for being here. Thank you. Nina Dannenberg is the Senior Director of Administration for the Texas offices of Kirkland and Mellis. She calls 609 Main, uh, which is a Heinz developed and managed property in Houston, her office home. And uh, Nina has held a variety of positions around the globe in her 15 year tenure at Kirkland and Ellis, making her the go-to person for operations and business transformation and, and change solutions. Um, so as a member of uh, Kirkland and Ellis's Return to the Workplace Task Force, she provides insight from running a suite of corporate functions um, in a predominantly office-based legal firm and how to think about the return from that uh, perspective. So thank you, Nina. Mary Edmonds is a Senior Managing Director of Human Resources here at Heinz, and she's, she leads Human Resources for Heinz in Europe. So over her career, she has been known as a change leader. Her experience spans the globe from Britain, the Middle East, the United States, and today she's joining us from London. She is living the return in real time with us, um, as some of our offices are open in Europe, and she's been an invaluable member of our global HR team here at Heinz as we've managed um, this return to workplace situation. So thank you, Mary. And then Jay Perso is the America's Vice Chair of Risk Management at Ernst & Young. He's joining us today from Philadelphia. And in uh, nearly 30 years at EY, Jay has led many global accounts. He's built several areas of practice and he continues to be a critical and trusted voice across EY during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, providing the risk management lens and future focused leadership to help navigate the complexities presented by this virus, not only for the workforce across EY, for their client service model as well. Um, we're proud to have EY as a tenant in two of our office buildings in the US. So thank you, Jay, for being here. And thanks to those of, us, those of you joining us on Zoom, please chat us your questions at any point as we go through today's dialogue. And uh, we'd love to get to as many of those questions as we can. And I'll let you know that this session is being recorded. Replays will be available. So let's jump in. I'd like to start by focusing on how employees and, uh, and real employers and real estate leaders have been delivering a safe and effective return to the workplace so far. Um, I, I have heard it said and have taken it as my mantra that return is a muscle, not a plan. Uh, this is an ever-changing situation that we have to be ready to adapt and be agile within um, while adhering to some, 
some principles that, uh, that we need to anchor on to effectively manage risk and hold to our standards and hold to our culture. Um, I saw a recent survey by the World at Work that showed two thirds of organizations plan to resume in office operations by the end of the summer. And I know we at Heinz have been managing a transition as many of you have as well back to the workplace. So a lot to go on here from the experiences we're all living at this moment. Um, so I'd like to start with you, Nina, and, and ask what have we learned so far about how to safely return employees to the workplace? Yeah, Stephanie, I think what you said about uh, return being a muscle rather than like a fixed plan is, is absolutely correct. There's certainly no one size fits all. Um, every location, every city, every country is is its own its own position that you have to evaluate on on the merits of where it's located. So I think there's a lot of um, a lot of agility required from all of us as we assess how we return back to the office and to to make it safe for everyone to return to the office. I think is is has to be the underpinning foundation of every decision that you make, right? I mean, looking at Houston with the recent spike in numbers, you have to be able to react to situations like those. I think on overall, the common themes of like what, what I've hear, heard from others too is you want to be prepared for the most risk averse person to be comfortable and then work your way from there and look at your space and see how you implement that to ensure the safety of everyone. Thanks. I, would, I mean, it, it, it's oh. Steph, but if I could, this is Jay, if I could jump in, just you know, maybe, maybe just add a couple of thoughts. Nina, I, I completely agree with you. That was really well said. Um, you know, if I look at our organization, just within the United States, we have about 60,000 people uh, and, and, and we're planning or we have planned for a return, you know, for the country. But the you know how we return is is going to depend very much on the state of the virus you know and in, in, in specific markets and so while the plan is there and the framework you know what we need to do uh what it looks and feels like for an employee for one of our clients for our community those are all very specifically laid out i mean as you know as, as you mentioned uh how we execute you know is largely dependent on the state of the virus on the mindset of our people and so I think, you know, the one thing that I think about a lot with our team is to be ready to, to change. And I think the example you raised right now of Houston with recent spikes is a very good example that we, we, we've done great planning. We think we've done great planning, but it could change. And this is also new that, that um, you know, the, maybe that's the biggest lesson is to be ready to change the plan, <laughs> you know, depending on what happens, you know, tomorrow or today. And, I, and I, I loved hearing from our tenants in, in Kirkland and E&Y because as an operator of the real estate, you know, for Heinz, I, I love our thematic way we've approached this. When you're ready, we're ready, right? We have to be, be nimble, adaptable, and really fluid in the way we manage this. There's no playbook as an operator. There's no playbook as a real estate developer, investor. We've got to really be nimble and, and flexible for clients and for our tenants. So I think that's the, the theme within which we're approaching this return to occupancy. And here in Europe, the framework that we have used as representative of what Heinz globally has asked us to do, but with 10 different countries, 10 different jurisdictions in which we operate, it's not only about the individual, but it's also about the government guidelines and Heinz's requirements for the return to work. And keeping all three of those in balance in a moving feast as things evolve on a daily basis in, in recent times uh, is really important for us to continue to reflect on that whole balance of what the individual needs, what the government is requiring for all of its um, inhabitants of the geography and also what Heinz requires from us as we stay safe and return to work. And so as we're flexible, as we, you know, as we leave room to, to flex these muscles, adapt and plan, what are some of the principles um, or conditions, gating criteria that you all observe are important to stay true to, to stay, you know, more, more firm to 
right? As, as we move around other, you know, uh, changing dynamics. I, I've, I'll start. I think there's some fundamental uh, changes that we've all observed and we've all implemented, you know, the, the screening mechanisms that we've all had to put in place um, before our tenants and, and our occupants return to the office certainly has to stay in place and, and for the foreseeable future. I, it's, it's the first point of entry into these buildings that are really vertical incubators. So we've got to be, be really rigid and, and uh, you know, focused on, on that screening at the, the entry point into our buildings. And then operationally within the buildings, as, as our occupants start to move within the buildings, we've got to maintain that, that spatial distancing that, that is, is so important and mandated by, you know, the health professionals, um, you know, and, and we have to be fluid even in those, you know, parameters as well. We've, we've heard, you know, six feet, five feet, four feet. Uh, we've got elevators that we're trying to put people in to move them vertically. I just think really in, in totality, in terms of operating the, the, the buildings, we've got some, some fundamental criteria about screening and about distancing and about certainly, you know, increased levels of, of hygiene and cleaning, but uh, that really drive all our decisions. But even within those, those buckets, we've got to be, be flexible and, you know, understanding we may have to ramp up in some instances, depending on what happens as we start to return to occupancy. Yeah, uh, you know, Steph, and and picking up a little bit on on Andrew's points just now, the 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 way we've thought about you know governing our return, um, you mentioned you know gating conditions or what we call them conditions precedent on the things that need to be in place in order for us to make the return to one of our offices, and and you know th those are in maybe three general buckets if you like. First, that you know, the, the local government, the state government, all the governments really have lifted their shelter at home orders. And we're generally there, again, across the US for the most part. Um, and then, you know, the rest of it is very much based on, on the virus itself. So, so the, the data, you know, what is the data telling us in terms of cases, in terms of testing? And then we look at a derivative, you know, what, what is that derivative if you, if you take, um, excuse me, new cases divided by, by, by testing. And, and the experts all refer to that number of five or less. And so we're watching that very closely in addition to other things like hospitalizations and the like. And what we'd like to see is a trend, you know, uh, for a 28 day period. And the reason we chose 28, it's two times 14. <laughs> so, so 14 days, you know, are, are what the experts say is the cycle of the virus to see it um, fully expressed. And so we, we thought we'd go two cycles. And so if, if we were a 28-day period, we see that decline. You know, as I mentioned earlier, then, you know, we'd be ready to go to our phase one. And, and like everyone else, you know, that we speak with, everyone's doing the phased approach. First, you go to a small number of people, and then you successively go up, depending on how you do through those phases. And, and, and so we're on our way. We haven't opened an office yet, but, but we think we're on our way in some places. You know, we, we hopefully are there during the summer uh, and then we'll manage through that, you know, over the rest of the year. On Andrew's points around, you know, what do you then do, you know, in this new environment? I mean, the, clearly we have, you know, a lot of habits that we want to build into our business as usual for all of our employees and all of our clients. And so that involves a lot of, you know, sort of personal habits that hopefully we've all internalized over the last three months or so around masks and, you know, washing our hands. So those messages continue every day. Uh, and then around the buildings, you know, very disciplined around, um, you know, the common areas being cleaned and the like, and we're working with all of our landlords like yourselves to, to make sure we get that right. And ventilation, you know, ventilation and air circulation has been a major issue that to focus on, a major area to focus on, you know, given what we've learned over the last two or three months that, you know, if you can keep the air moving, if you're outside, you're probably in better shape than if you're inside. And if you have to be inside, you know, wear your mask and, you know, keep the air moving. So we're very focused in working, you know, with our partners like yourselves and, and getting ventilation and air circulation and those things, you know, to the best level that we can get them. Jay, it's very interesting what you're saying about the gating criteria all the way through to making sure the environment is appropriate. 
uh, one of the things that I didn't expect when we were returning to work here in Europe was that I would have to think about the international borders that exist. So those who work in Luxembourg can live in Germany, in France, or in Belgium. And all of those countries had different things going on and had different requirements. And you could get through one way on the border, but in some cases it was difficult to get back the other way. And so the idea of opening the office with all of these um, complications was an additional kind of uh, level of, um, of awareness that we had to investigate and understand in order to get those who maybe needed to get to the office for a document or for something. Um, there were a lot of requirements. So that was, a, that was an interesting additional element that we had to consider in our gating criteria. Yeah, and I think one, one other point on that is also just um, normal services like childcare and schools. Obviously, you know, we can't expect people to be back in the office when they have their kids at home and have to make sure that they are okay. So um, to all of your points, I think it's, it's such a wider net of considerations that you have to think about. It's not just about your business anymore. It's just about so much more. And again, I think people as the underlying issue, you have to be able to to think about all those aspects and as they, as they impact your employees as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I'm hearing, you know, aligning on a consistent set of gating criteria to determine when it is safe, not only, you know, combination of at the governmental level as well as, you know, at the firm level, when the firm believes that it's safe and it's the right time to return. Um, and uh, a set of policies and practices and standards um, for wellness, for cleanliness in the office. And, you know, there's a, there's a change management effort, right, around not only, as you're saying, teaching employees about this, but holding them accountable and holding a, you know, a zero tolerance policy to, he to health and safety issues in, in this environment. And there's a, there's a real change management um, exercise around, you know, moving employees through this journey and, and you know, helping them feel engaged, empowered, um, and in control, as we all would like to feel in our lives. So let's talk about how employees feel. Um, let's talk about uh, who, if employees feel they're ready, and how we approach this from a change management perspective. Uh, so at, at, at Heinz, we've been running um, employee pulse surveys every six weeks or so as an additional way to hear from our employees about how they're doing in the crisis and to learn how we can best support them. In our more recent surveys, we began asking um, how ready people felt, given the conditions in their current, in their location, how ready people felt to come back to the workplace and what types of tasks they felt um, they could get much more value out of doing from the physical office, along with which types of tasks they are actually more efficient at doing from home. Um, so we're gonna um, hear from our panelists on this question, but before we do, we're going to hear from our uh, our audience on Zoom as well. Um, so we're going to put up a, a poll question for you. Um, if you surveyed your workforce as well on who's ready to come back um, and who is not, we're going to ask you what percentage of employees at your workplace said they were ready. So Lisa, if you could put the poll up for us, please. Thank you. And after we show the results from our audience, we'll um, hear from the panel on how that compares to what you've seen among your employees and your, and your clients. Okay. Shall we look at the results? Okay, so the majority of folks said, you know, between zero to 25% but also a large portion, 25 to 50 percent, um, with some groups saying, you know, the, the majority of folks are ready to return now. Um, you know, I think most recently I saw yesterday Glassdoor ran a survey that showed 75 percent of employee, employees on Glassdoor felt eager to get back to the office. Um, and I think among this panel we're also going to see some different perspectives as well. So um, panelists, how does what you're seeing on the ground compare to what we're seeing from our poll results here? Yeah, I, I think um, the poll results are, are probably very reflective of what you hear generally. Um, 
up to 25% ready to return. I, I think that goes back to like how risk averse are you as a person, right? If you, if you feel like, oh, you're home alone and you would prefer to be in the office out of convenience, or you like haven't really got the responsibility to look after children, I think you would be more inclined to wanting to come back. Um, and I think a, a huge impact on that is also in how the virus spreads. Like Houston was doing well in May and you know there was there there were certainly more people that were ready to come back, whereas now in June the numbers are spiking to really high numbers. So that would um, that would go down. People prefer to stay home. I think you'll always have some that want to be in the office or feel that the office would be more convenient. But I think overall that is very reflective of, of what the market says in general. Yeah, and, and I can add to that, Nina, that, you know, in, in our Northeast region, in, in the offices that we have reopened, um, the survey is reflected. Less than 25% of the occupants have come back into the office, uh, notwithstanding that the offices are open and their employers uh, or tenants have said, you are able to come back to work. We still see numbers that are sub 25%, in some instances, sub 15% in terms of the, the occupancy that have decided to come back into the office. So it is certainly reflective of the larger society and, and you know the wide range of you know, personal preferences that exist. And again, underscoring why we've, we've got to be ready because the, the, the flip side of that is, you know, there could be a point in 30, 60 days when that number doubles. And, you know, as, as operators of the real estate, we've also got to be prepared and not lull that because there's only 20% of the occupants coming in, it'll that be that way long term. So we're, we're all hopeful, I think, of getting to a point where the majority are comfortable coming back into the offices, you know, starting the economic engine and revitalizing our, our cities. So, you know, that's that's the aspiration. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. it's been interesting to see too on, you know, how these numbers can differ um, between industries, between employee job types and, and functions. Um, you know, I, I just anecdotally hear examples from other firms where sometimes it's the corporate functions that are kind of less ready to return than the, the business facing or revenue producing functions. Makes sense. Well, yeah. Um, I, and Jay, that, I think you, yeah. you guys ran a survey too, right? Of your own folks? Yeah, that, that's a great, I mean, I think you've, you've made a great point there, Steph. The, 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 I mean, essential workers have been working, you know, throughout and, you know, and others, I mean, our, our clients cover the full spectrum. And you're absolutely right on, on the in, on, it depends on the industry. And if you're able to work remotely as we are in our firm, for example, um, the, the mindset of our workforce is very much about not returning soon. So if you, I go to the survey question you asked, you know, we'd be in the, in the zero to 25 uh, mm -hmm. bucket, you know, the, the last survey we did, um, what we tried to get to was, you know, are you able to work effectively from home? Do you have to leave your home to go, you know, get your work done? And that number was almost 100%. People are perfectly fine, you know, being where they are at home. Um, so no reason to go back uh, if they don't have to, other than, the, you know, the social aspect of being in an office and missing the things that we've all, we've all become used to. The other question we asked is, if there was an office available, would you go for a day or two a week? And that was more interesting, I would say, about 20% said that they would for a day or two, just for a change, you know, to be in a different environment and start to go back to feeling like it's a bit normal again. So we're watching that very closely. I do think, you know, what happens, what you see in the press, you know, what you see in the in, in, in spikes and, and things of that nature impacts very much our mindset. And so, you know, if you were to focus on the states that are spiking right now within the US and did a survey, you know, on Monday, you'd probably find that there was a very, there was an even smaller percentage interested in going back. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so we're, we're doing it periodically. We'll, we'll do another one next week. Um, and unclear what those numbers will tell, but my hypothesis is that, you know, Andrew, where you are, uh, that percentage of, with an interest in returning will be higher than it was the last time. And in states like Texas and Arizona, 
that percentage might be lower. That, 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 that's just my, my guess. Yeah. Right. I, think, I think you're yeah. probably right. As we experience it in Europe, where we had Italy so interested in going back, our heat map, the first survey that we did um, across the globe that um, Stephanie led, or Steph led, was um, a map that showed that lots of people weren't interested in going back. And then the second time we did it, we had moved through the crisis a little further. People had a different attitude. They had been isolated for much longer time. We have a lot of young people in our organization in Europe. We have a lot of um, analysts and associates who learn. 70% of their learning is on the job. And so they need those colleagues. They need those people who are just in front of them to be available to help them figure out that model that they've got to do in order to um, deliver on their, on their projects. And so then we saw things moving towards the middle and our heat map started to look a little bit different. And then finally, most recently, we've had lots of countries as they were really preparing to go back, showing what it's gonna look like to be back at the office, talking to people about how that's going to help creativity and engagement and collaboration and coaching. Coaching has done you know, really well when it's face-to-face. -face. So these things helped move our curve along um, and encourage people back to work. And also sometimes the way that it was set up by the leader, Javier in France, he set it up so that we had teams, team A and team B, who were going to go back to work. And team A could choose to go back to work or not. But if you were going to back to work, you would be there with team A three days a week or you just didn't go in. And the same with team B, you couldn't just choose a day or two. And so that created a pull towards the office to say, am I in or am I going to be out? And that had a really positive effect on the encouragement and the, um, and the attendance of uh, pretty much 60% of that office. It's slightly unusual because they have a lot of space. It's a big office. And so they can get a lot of people back to work. And Mary, I love that, you know, deliberate programmatic approach. It, it might be something here in the States we can learn from Europe because it's not just throwing the doors open and saying, okay, 50% of the workforce can come back to work. It's really deliberately thinking through a strategy that gets teams together to collaborate because that really is a big missing piece. There's a lot we've done well virtually. There's a lot we've been effective at, but I, I have my own personal reservations to your point that we can effectively coach, counsel, teach, build a culture by doing these meetings, right? Uh, I, so, so I think that uh, example from, from Paris, I think is, is you know, something we'll, I'd, I'd love to learn a little bit more on. So uh, thank you for that. Well, well let's, let's go there, Andrew. I mean, for our next kind of shifting the conversation, really wanted to think forward to the future and say, okay, we've all now been parachuted into a behavioral science experiment that happened around us. Um, we have the opportunity to study what happened to us and what, wh how did we collaborate? How did we learn? What was harder? What was easier? You know, what, what have we, what do we understand better now about how we learn, how we coach, how we, how we interact personally and emotionally over a forum like, like this one? Um, and as we prepare to come out of this, um, hopefully, let's not miss the opportunity to reflect on what we learned on what happened and, and how we might carry forward some of what we learned about what makes us most collaborative and what makes us most engaged with one another. Um, so, so I'd love to hear from you all um, and, and maybe I'll throw this to, to Nina first. What, what have we learned about the changing nature of collaboration and creativity from yeah. what we've been through? Yeah, I think you, you put it really well. We have been thrown into this without really giving it and giving us any time to really prepare for this fully remote working module. And obviously, if, you, if you're not fully used to it, it's something you have to familiarize yourself with. How do you connect with your team? And I think the one thing um, you realize is pretty quickly how much you take for granted the office environment where you can just pop your head into someone's office or you need to talk to someone and you know they're just up the corridor. So it's there's a lot of um, change that is required from each one of us to be much more deliberate about creating those connections when you're not in the same space. And um, you know, from my point of view, I, I have made sure that I have 
frequent touch points with my team as a team, also as individuals. And I think one thing I found um, really important, especially in the first two, three weeks of, of being at home, is that you really have to improve your active listening skills so much more because you're not in the same environment and people are stressed out right you know it's just wholly new environment an unprecedented global pandemic nobody knows what's going to happen and you know our um our responsibility as as leaders and as, as team leaders and even as colleagues is to make sure that we all get through this together and in one piece if we so will. So I, I think there is a lot to be learned from that taking it out of this hopefully going back into the work um, environment is that A, I think we have realized that there is a much more um, flexibility in, in the way you can work together. It doesn't a lot of it doesn't have to be face to face. And I think the willingness to do things that are not just fully work focused, like I had a couple of team, virtual team building events with, with my team. We did like a little treasure hunt and um, a little trivia play. And it's just, it's, it's just bringing us back together, even though it is virtually. And I think that that will help us keeping the connection going, even if, if the work remote, remote work continues to some level for some time. I, I would say, I, I think, you know, certainly agree with, with Nina, you know, deliberate, uh, you know, programmatic, we, we've, we've learned we, we have to have informal Zoom meetings, we've, we've got to have formal Zoom meetings, we've got to be much more structured and, and uh, you know, focused on ensuring that we've got that collaboration, we've got that, uh, you know, team uh, focused mentality. And, and, and virtual meetings have worked well. We, we all know that we've all been, been effective. The, the, the one gap for me in, in terms of leading people that I get concerned uh, around is, is really th those casual collisions that we have in the office, right? The, the spontaneity of those interactions. And to Mary's point, how do we coach, counsel, build people? When people are stressed and they have a challenge, they, you can't say, let me go set up a Zoom meeting to go address that, right? It, it's it's got to be much more, you know, <laughs> you, you got to align that correctly. And, and sometimes the moment's missed. Whereas if I'm in the office and a colleague has a, an issue, they can come pop right into my office and have that conversation immediately because the need is immediate. So it, it is a gap, you know, and in as much as it, it has worked well, I think I, I could get concerned with the, that culture building, that, that uh, team development, that individual personnel development that happens so spontaneously and, and in, in some instances, not from planned meetings and not from planned mentoring sessions. And so, uh, you know, that's how do we solve for that, right? Mm -hmm. Whilst the vast majority of the time it works well, that's, that's a piece that, that we still have to, to, to master, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mary, I'd love to hear from you too about the, the talent challenges and team leadership challenges that, that you're seeing or opportunities that you're seeing. But Andrew, when you were speaking, I was, you, you talked about the, the pop into my office um, imperative. That's so valuable. That's so important as part of our day to day. Um, and and I, I did some virtual office hours mm -hmm. where um, I said, you know, during these times, pop into my office. You know, and and we use the waiting room feature and whatnot, and it's not you know it's not the same. I I, I do notice that um, on Zoom, it feels to me like in general we're still figuring out our norms for mm -hmm. how we operate with one another on Zoom for sure. But it feels to me like people tend to hold back a little bit more on Zoom, oh, or well. you know not let their guard down quite as much on Zoom. So so there is that uh, that I notice. But I, I was struck that um, when I held office hours on Zoom, people were much more willing to pop in to my office hours on Zoom than uh -huh. they were to email me or to ask to schedule time with me, you know, to formally have to schedule it or set it up. Um, okay. So I personally thought that was interesting. I was reminded of that by what you said. But, but Mary, I would love to hear from you too on the kind of talent, you know, challenges and opportunities that you see. Well, I, I have had the opportunity to join many 
external um, meetings where everybody is searching for information and insight and best practice in this. Um, I had somebody say to me, I've never done a pandemic before, so I'm not quite sure how to respond in this instance. And I feel that we all feel that way. We've never done a pandemic before, so how do we lead in this? And you do have to lead in this crisis um, through your values and through who you deeply are within, within yourself. And so when I was speaking with some uh, Urban Land Institute, ULI, young leaders, and had the opportunity for them to come back to me and, and ask me questions in a breakout session of 45, um, they were asking, should I quit my job? Should I jump? Should I run to another, another, another sector? Because I'm in retail and I should probably go to industrial, right? That's what I should do. Should I go do an MBA? And so all of these questions were showing the emotion of what a kind of 20 to 26 year old is, is feeling in this time for themselves. And that's across the board. These, these folks were smart. They were able to deliver. They had everything in their future going for them. And they felt completely um, untethered at, at that moment. And so the advice that I gave, and I'll give it again here, is number one, where you are is a great place to watch this and learn from this and lean into this because the experience that you get in this uncertain environment will serve you very well in the future. And if you don't change any variables that you have control over, but look for the change in the variables that you don't have control over and, and try and figure out how to make that work for you and your development, this is the time to be broad and to take risks in your career to say, yes, I'll try that. I've never done it before, but I'll lean in and I'll try and deliver that for the organization. And so that was one example. The other one was, um, should I do an MBA? And I said, yes, if you're gonna do an MBA, do it in four years time when all the data is in, the reports have been written and it'll be a much more interesting MBA than the one that you would do in 2021. So um, those were my bits of advice to them. Internally, coming home and thinking about it, we have, um, obviously different, as I talked about before, the different um, levels within the organization of experience that people have. And tools that keep performance on the road are super important. Tools that give output indicators, what you need to do in order to deliver. How you get it done is going to vary because I don't know what your home situation is. I don't know what hours you need to work. I don't know who you can call on at different points, but the output that I need from you is this and by giving them clear steerage on this is what we have to deliver and this is what we'll deliver together and giving them that regular drumbeat rhythm of a performance management process i'm finding to be very soothing to, for many people because it's the one constant and something familiar in a world of so much change and so much difference so that would be one of the things that from an internal uh, perspective the other thing is that Steph and I have been um, leading together on is the um, leading through uncertainty. Steph, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So Mary and I have been doing taking our, our leadership development at Heinz Virtual uh, in this environment and have been doing global um, virtual group coaching sessions for leaders across the firm. And you know, there have been small group virtual sessions where leaders um, get together and we have an executive coach, uh, external executive coach facilitate those, you know, but it's, it's a moment to align on our, our leadership principles. So align on purpose, right? Bring people back to the shared purpose, shared culture, shared core, um, and get some coaching on what is inevitably a learning curve for all of us, right? We all have blind spots in this environment. We all have opportunities to learn more about ourselves and our team leadership in this environment. So, I think it's been important, especially in the absence of having everyone together in the workplace, to come together and create virtual forums to have some of that same dialogue. And having been the, the beneficiary of one of those uh, sessions, uh, Steph and Mary, I enjoyed it tremendously. I, I love the breakout rooms. I, I, I thought it was extremely valuable as, as a leader to, to have gone through that, that, that session quick anecdote that came out of that session that uh, I, I thought about after is I realized how, how challenging <laughs> nonverbal communication, hand gestures, and all these things that we, we have the benefit of in person, 
that we don't have on Zoom meetings, right? You know, I realized how much I focus on not just actively listening to what people are saying, but seeing how their body language and their hand gestures are, are reacting to, to, to be able to, to understand and, and truly react. And, and it was almost disconcerting every other Zoom meeting that I got into. I said, I, I can't see hands. I can't see how people are reacting to what I'm saying. But um, yeah, it, it, it was just a, a funny um, observation I had post one of those meetings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Great. Well, I, I would love to, you know, shift us, given all that we're learning about, about collaboration, about creativity, about, you know, these nuances of what makes a really meaningful interaction with one another. Um, I want to explore what this means for how we use the physical office in the future um, and how that might be different. Um, you know, if we count on our physical workplaces to be places for transmitting the culture, for creating shared purpose, modeling shared purpose, for getting access to leadership, for the micro team interactions that build social capital. Um, you know, I, I keep thinking about how our physical office won't be able to achieve any of those things if it feels like a crime scene to go there. Um, and then conversely, it won't be able to achieve those things if we don't have enough safety precautions for employees to know and trust that it is safe um, as a place to be. So that that's a difficult, um, line to, to walk. So I'd love to dig into that and explore it. And um, as a way to lead into it, we want to um, do another polling question. So if I could ask my colleague Lisa to please bring up the next poll, we'd like to ask, what are the aspects of work that your employees miss most about the physical workplace? You see a few options there, including an option of my employees do not miss the physical workplace. All right, so I think we'll bring up the results of the poll, see what people said. Impromptu collaboration across departments and groups was far and away the majority response. Um, so I'd love to get the, the panelists' reaction to this. And as you, as you react to this, and um, you know, Jay, perhaps we could start with you. Um, you know, how, how will what we're seeing here, what we're learning here, impact our future space planning and future strategies for the physical office? Well, it's, um, without a doubt, uh, it, it will change um, for sure. Uh, you know, the, the polling question was very interesting. I, I think what I hear from our people, <clears throat> it's the social aspect of how we relate to each other. The comments you guys made earlier about, you know, the Zoom meetings and the Teams meetings and the like, um, it's interesting, the facial expressions on these meetings become even more important because you key in only that, you don't see what the person is doing, you don't have the other senses that we all use, uh, that we don't know we're using. And so it, 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 you, I've learned a lot from that, you know, just kind of focusing on people and what they say or don't say, to the point where we've asked everyone, you know, to not do voice only, right? Just so we can at least have some ability to continue to relate to each other other than voice. Having said that, I think people are missing very much the opportunity to be in an environment, you know, where we can actually get things done together. We think what that will look like, just given the nature of our work, is that we're gonna have very much of a hybrid structure where, you know, we have adopted collaboration tools in a space of two weeks that in the past may have taken us two years, right? Because we were forced to do it. And so people did it very quickly, we were forced to do it, and now that we're doing it, we're all yearning for some kind of balance. I think, you know, you know, we used to be the organization that would travel wherever you wanted us. And I would argue today that we don't think it's going to be like that anymore. It'll probably be 50-50 down the road, you know, when we get to a steady state, whenever that is. Um, and we're changing a whole bunch of policies. We're changing how we train and develop, you know, a combination of, of virtual and physical. But the physical absolutely will come back uh, because we don't think working like this is something that we can sustain, that, anybody, that any human being can sustain or any group for a long time. So we, we will go back to physical space until the point where we have a vaccine and we think we're out of the woods. That space 
will continue to be there. It'll probably be occupied by 40, 50% of the people once we're comfortable. Um, I don't see us in a room, you know, collaborating on whiteboards and things like that the way we used to, but I do think the ability to kind of look at each, at each other, we're going to get there. And our ongoing, you know, practices, especially around recruiting, Mary, and, and the things you were talking about earlier, learning and development, we're spending an, a, a disproportionate amount of time on that because we know that we have to find a way to do this better. And it's something we've always known we've had to do because of generational differences in how people learn, right? We've had sort of the more mature generation that prefer things one way. And, you know, most of our workforce are in their 20s who prefer things another way. And I would argue that we're shifting more towards how the 20 somethings prefer things. The older people like myself are, are doing that. So th th those things are coming. We don't know what the picture looks like yet, but we, we think this virtual physical coexistence that we've all argued for for many years when people talk about digital transformation is here, right? And, and, and it's here to stay. Um, offices will not go away. They may look a lot different, but, we have enough people telling us that we need to get back together, you know, as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I'd, I'd love to get your, your thoughts too yeah. on what, you know, how, how you think, you know, from, from a property management facilities management perspective, this will impact future space planning needs. There was also a question that came in in the meantime from uh, someone in our audience uh, asking, do we think that uh, um, there will be permanent changes to the amount of um, time or employees, the number of employees working from home, and will that impact space planning needs as well? I'll try to address both, but a quick observation from the, the survey results. You know, the, disproportionately, the vast majority are saying what we miss are those casual collisions. You know, what gives me pause is that even in our return to occupancy environment, the way the offices are set up, it's not conducive to casual collisions, right? It, it, it's set up to, to create six feet of distance between people and us having masks on and you know, isolating ourselves and connecting only when we have to. So even as we get back into the office, um, you know, we're, we're, we're what people are yearning for, which are those impromptu meetings, impromptu pop into the offices, that's being discouraged. So how do we synergize those two kind of disparate needs, right? It, it, we need to create the spatial distance, but we still need those casual collisions. In, in terms of design and getting back to the office, I'm hopeful, and, and, and Jay mentioned it, right? There's a point in time where we're gonna get to a vaccine and we're gonna get beyond this. So what we're really trying to solve for is, you know, the next 12 months, 18 months, you know, maybe less if we're, we're hopeful. Um, and I think we, we all have to acknowledge as, as developers, operators, and, and, and consumers of the physical real estate that this is a, a limited time opportunity for us to figure out the best way to meet those two dis disparate needs of, you know, the people connectivity as well as being safe and, and, and creating that distance that the health professionals are mandating. Uh, it'll require certainly a redesign, but again, I'm hopeful in the short term, right? What we're seeing, the way offices are being uh, structured to allow for that return to occupancy is short term. So we should build it flexibly, right? To, to understand that there'll be a point in time where we're going to pivot, perhaps not back to wh where we had the offices being designed in January of this year, but some hybrid of what we were designing and developing and building with the way it is today, right? How do we do it safely? But there's gonna be a vaccine. We're gonna get more comfortable. We're gonna get more people back in the office because for the attraction and retention of that talent, Jay, and for the, 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 the collaboration that's necessary for the, the coaching and mentoring, development of people, right? This is about our intellectual capital, right? That's, that's the most important asset that we have. And we've got to find a way to bridge that gap between the space, the physical real estate and, and what people are, are craving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. You know, Nina, I'd love to get your, um, your reactions and what you're seeing at, at Kirkland and Alice too. And, and also if you are, you know, your, your perspective on the, um, 
on the audience question on permanent changes to work from home policy, um, you know, what you anticipate seeing there? Yeah, you know, I think um, the, the work from home policy, I think not just for, for Kirkland or the legal industry, but I think every industry is that has been thrown into this and, and maybe has been hesitant before of like adopting a work from home um, schedule is, is, you know, realizing that it, it works. Like if your job is set up in a way that you can do it from home, the productivity doesn't necessarily have to drop. So I think overall there, there is bound to be an impact, right? The, the experience that we're having now with the work from home is going to carry forward in one way or another. I think it's, it, it's not a right point to say like, oh, this is going to happen or, you know, there's definitely going to be a, a fast shift into it. But I do think what Jay was saying earlier, there is, there is going to be a shift happening and we will probably have to see how that works out for different industries too, right? Um, I think the, the polling question is, is very reflective of what people miss the most is the social contact to their colleagues. And um, again, I, I know I keep saying risk averse, not risk averse, but I do think there's a lot of people that do not necessarily like to work from home. And I used to be like that. I was like, no, I don't want to work from home. I like being in the office. Now, you know, a couple of months in, I'm, I've actually gotten quite comfortable with my home setup, but yes, I do miss the social interaction with my colleagues. So I think it's not surprising, like, you know, we as humans are social animals, if you so will. So of course, we, that's going to be a big portion of what we miss, and that's how we usually connect. Um, and very much to all the points that Jay and Andrew made about, you know, not being able to see hand gestures and just being focused on the Zoom portion that you get to see in your window is, is lacking that little bit of extra that we as human beings probably crave as, as social interaction. So I think it's going to be interesting. And, uh, you know, in Houston, we have not, um, have not got people in the office uh, thus far other than critical functions. I think the, the interesting part is going to be once Houston is coming back and you know I know Asia is, is already back and Germany is, is back to some extent so there's, there's every country every location will probably roll into this a little bit differently but um, yeah it's, it's, it's going to be a change that is coming it's just going to be interesting to see what kind of magnitude it has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, certainly we've seen, you know, from our end at Heinz, we've, we've seen continued activity on new leases, um, lease renewals, new developments, and most recently Microsoft's announcement to occupy 523,000 square feet of new space at our Atlantic Yards project in Atlanta. So, you know, our, our data indicates strong ongoing demand for leading edge office space. Um, now, as yeah. you've all said, you know, the design within that space is probably going to take on new forms. And it seems like we're all really appreciating the importance of cross-team collaboration and how in a post-COVID world, the space really needs to allow for that because we've, we've now lived that when we have that stripped from us, that's one of the things that we miss most from the office and um, that we can't um, replicate in the same way in this virtual only environment. Yeah. And I, I do think that, you know, the office space is not going to go away. It's still going to be a place for people to come together. And it is a place of corporate culture. And, and there, there's, there's so many benefits to having an office space. So I, I think it's, it's going to maintain its position as part of, of every, every office, every industry. Okay. As, as we, um, look at collaboration and creativity and the way we're delivering it now, this is a great example. We have over 200 people on this call listening to our voices, taking in the um, ideas and creative solutions that we're coming up with. Internally, we do the same uh, where we're working on a project and we're trying to create that same environment again for creativity. We have people who will sit on a Microsoft team environment once a week in the morning so that they feel as if they're sitting across from each other in the office so they can do the creative work in thinking through 
how they're going to respond to an investor, how they're going to work through a problem that they can solve together. And so there are different ways that um, we're coming together. I, kn I know that um, investor meetings, uh, meeting with other HRDs from outside of the industry and within the industry has given me a new way of, of thinking about um, solutions. So I'm, I'm collaborating and creating from many different networks, more so than I probably would have been doing had I been in the office. So it's a, it's a different set of collaborations, not replacing it, but um, enriching what the opportunities are right now. Yeah, yeah, great points, great points. So everyone, we're, we're almost at the close and I'd love to save time to go quickly around the horn and hear some closing thoughts from, from all of you. Um, and, and Mary, maybe I'll, I'll start with you. Um, the closing question is, if you could go back and talk to yourself in January 2020, your January self, what is one piece of advice you would give about how to lead through and manage through this situation? So it, had I known what was, what was coming in, um, in January, um, I would have been very uh, diligent and deliberate about supporting leaders in ensuring that they had the skills to help individuals at a one-on-one -on -one level so that we could continue to grow and continue to head in the direction from a scale perspective that is on our strategy. We're, we're doing that now, but I would have implemented earlier um, maybe some of, the, some of the things of being careful and being um, confident in knowing that we need to go slow here in order to go fast later on and pay attention to the science, pay attention to what's happening globally and learn as much as you can so that we can implement and come through this faster. Great, thanks. Andrew, can I pass it to you next? Sure, Steph, you know, just thinking about it from a, a more macro level, um, you know, pre-COVID there was this, you know, kind of clever statement that was going around, you know, people plus performance and productivity equals profitability. And as I think about this, this pandemic, um, you know, perhaps as, you know, a country, as, as a, a global, uh, you know, environment, we were a little slow on the jump, right? Because we didn't want to believe this was real and that the impacts were going to be there because that profitability piece impacted our thinking, that performance and productivity impacted our thinking. But the most important part, the people, the first P, Really, we, we should be conservative. What I would have done if I were in power in, in January of 2020 is read, read all the signs and con err on the side of being conservative. Let's shut it down because without the people, nothing else follows. And to lose one life is, is a travesty. So let's, let's take a chance and shut it down early or do what we need to do and react, understanding that we might, might act too early. But isn't it better to act early than to act too late? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Nina, piece of advice yeah. you give yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, so all, all the high points have already been hit, but um, to following on from Andrew's point, I think um, one thing going back to January is, is, as Andrew said, like go and look at other countries and, and you know, be an early adopter of, of what's working. So my, my advice had in that situation would have been to really start contact tracing really early and prepare the people for this is like a long haul thing like the the impact that it really has i think in the beginning everyone was kind of like oh yeah we like you know it's going to be a month and then we're kind of through with it and i think we all learned very quickly that that is not the case so going back i i think um doing the Groundwork early is going to benefit us in the long run very much to what Andrew said. Okay, thank you. Jay, closing thoughts. Uh, similar, similar to all, all of my friends here on the panel. Um, you know, we knew this was there. We saw it happening in Asia. Um, but I think, <laughs> I would say, none of us thought it could really happen to us the way it did. I mean, I, I think if you're really honest about it, that's we felt and I think when we finally took it seriously at the end of February um, it was still uneven right we, we went to work from home early we thought it was early people were telling us it was early but it turns out that we could have done it even two weeks earlier 
Um, so so I, I'd say that's the big lesson out of this is if, I mean, this virus, uh, what the expert, what I learned at the beginning of March from talking to the scientists is it's the, 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 the mortality is not like SARS or H1N1 before. It's much lower. But because it's lower and it's so contagious, right, they, on a scale of 1 to 10, they call it an 11 in terms of, of dangerous, right? You know, because it can spread so easily. And so I think that sort of dialogue at the beginning of these things is important to get people's attention. And so looking to the next one, I, I hope we don't have another one like this, but you know, the, these things do happen. Um, that would be the big thing I hope we learn as a society is, you know, really get the message out quickly. And to Andrew's point, if we overreact, so be it. But because, you know, the, the cost could be very high. Great. Well, thank you for your thoughts. Thank you to the whole panel. I know we're at time here, so we'll close. I just close by saying that, you know, a crisis really does bring clarity about what's truly important. And I think one thing we're hearing on this call is that the world needs human connection now, uh, safely, more than ever. And, um, and I think that the built environment and the workplace will rise to the occasion um, to provide that in, in new ways. Um, we'll integrate the digital and the virtual with the sense of community that's offered by a physical space. And, and I think we can really evolve the workplace experience from what we're learning. And I think if we do this together with employees, with using change management, engaging employees through the process, um, we can come out on the other side of this stronger than we went into it. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you for your questions and your engagement. Thank you to the panelists. Um, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. <laughs>